Good morning again. It is good uh, to be with you as we are in the second week now of talking about um, what does it look like to be a person of prayer. And if you were here last week, uh, we began that sermon series and looking at the first four verses of Luke chapter 11, when the disciples see Jesus praying and as he returns to be back with them, one of the disciples says to Jesus, teach us to pray in the imperative voice. They want to know how to pray. They want the pattern for prayer. And so what Jesus gives them in the Gospel of Luke and also in the Gospel of Matthew is what we often call the Lord's Prayer. But if you look at the Lord's Prayer, it really is more the disciples' prayer because it's instructing the disciples how to pray. But let's face it, sometimes it is a struggle to pray. As a pastor, I have to acknowledge that as well. There have been times in my life life and events that I have prayed at where I've actually been intimidated to pray. I hope that makes you feel a little bit better about your own prayer life, right? With all the time and money and energy I've invested in going to seminary and being a pastor who can stand up here and preach to you like I do, and there's still those moments where it's hard to know how to pray. It's hard to know what to pray. It's hard to know, you know, Lord, what are the words that you would have me say? Because as a minister, I am at moments of great sorrow and at moments of great joy as well. And it's like, Lord, teach us to pray. But prayer is a great gift. And it's a gift that I feel blessed that I'm able to pray in so many different places. And so a couple weeks ago, Shannon and I were able to, um, this is just emotional, uh, Here we go. I didn't lose my place, by the way. That's just an emotional pause, if you're wondering what that is. Uh, as Scott alluded to, Sunhouse, our ministry to high school and middle school students, they had a baptism of eight students in one of our church members' pools. And so when we talk about why Sunhouse matters, it matters because we are teaching these kids about Jesus. And eight of them on a Sunday afternoon, three or four weeks ago, were baptized. And I had the privilege of being able to be there and talk to them and their parents about why baptism matters, about how Paul is literally, Apostle Paul describes it as dying to self and being raised to new life. And so when we talk to you and say that Sunhouse matters and we want you to invest in the work that we are doing, this is why. So we've got a very short video that we're going to show you of these eight students being baptized. Very cool. We know you couldn't all be there to celebrate that, so we wanted to capture just that very briefly and let you see when we ask you to invest in the work of Sunhouse, that is what you're giving to, to lives being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to be a part of that, um, there are pledge cards in front of you. You can go online and donate. And um, we've already, we set our goals about $400,000. We launched this little, well, literally launched it two years, two years ago, two weeks ago. Um, we're already at $150,000, so we're well on our way. So thank you. Um, very cool. Uh, we would love to exceed that $400,000, obviously, but we really want, and as I preached about this, this is a way that you invest in our students' ministry even though you're not able to volunteer or do other ways of, or help out in other ways, 
um, to be able to financially give so we can adapt what, is, what used to be the Kirk House and is now the Sun House uh, into a building where kids can learn about the love of Jesus. And like I said, it was awesome to be able to be there, to have Abe and Sophie literally baptizing those kids whom they have relationships with and to be able to bless those students. So prayer is great and prayer is awesome, but sometimes it is a struggle to pray. And I say that, I hope, in a way that encourages you because for those of you who are, here's, here's the, the rub of prayer. Everybody says and everybody knows they don't pray enough. Even those people who you know who pray four or five hours a day, they still feel guilt that they don't pray enough. And for those of us, those who don't pray at all, you feel guilt because you don't pray at all. So it doesn't really matter whether you pray a lot or you pray very little. We all feel like we don't pray enough. We, there are times in our lives where we get stuck in prayer. We don't really know how to pray, what to pray. We get intimidated. I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you or not. You start praying and you fall asleep. That's when that's called deep meditation, by the way, in case you want to know what happens in those moments. But, but it's a struggle. So, so I want to give you a couple of verses that remind you of the goodness of God, even the midst when we don't quite measure up in our prayer lives. This comes from the Gospel of Luke. You probably will remember this text as I read it. It's Jesus at the Mount, the Mount of Olives as he goes out to pray. And so this is verse 29 of Luke 22. Jesus went out as usual, right before the crucifixion, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. One thing, Jesus says, pray that you avoid falling into temptation. Now, you know what happens, right? You know the, the follow-up to this story. So this is verse 45, skipping down a couple of verses. So Jesus gets done praying. It says, when he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep. He gave them one thing to do. Pray that you don't fall into temptation. And what are, the tw what are those guys who have been with Jesus their whole lives, their, the last three years of their lives? They've seen him teach. They've seen him heal. They've done all, he's done all these amazing things, and they simply cannot stay awake. He found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. He says it again. But here's the great thing about Jesus. He doesn't just walk away from them. Because sometimes we do get tired. And sometimes we are too exhausted to pray. That's why I think the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6 says, bear one, another, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Jesus loves us even when we don't get it right. I've said this a couple of times since Easter that God's yes is stronger than any of our no's because God loves us so much. And so I want, when we talk about prayer, I want you to see it as something that is an encouraging gift that God gives to us. Prayer is essential in our lives because it is the way that we connect with God. And so today we're gonna to take a look at the, what follows after Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray. He, he tells a couple of stories to kind of get his point across. So we're in the Gospel of Luke. We're looking at chapter 11, and we're gonna be reading verses five through 13. Here's what we read. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't give up, get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your, get this, shameless audacity. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, 
though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Okay, so the first story that Jesus tells is about friends. One friend is asleep. Another friend shows up at midnight wanting a place to rest, but also needing to be fed. Now, here's the problem. The friend who had been asleep and is awakened by the friend who's arrived on a trip has no bread in the cupboard. There is no food in the house. He is literally empty-handed. Now, you and I wouldn't think much of this because we would just tell our friend to stop by 7-Eleven or Taco Bell on the way to our house, right? Like the issue of food is really not an issue that we face in this day and age. But in that culture, and as Jesus tells the story, there would have been this intense amount of shame on a person who would not have had a meal to prepare for a person who has come for a visit, whether unexpected or expected. But I love this imagery because the idea is particularly, remember, and this story, this parable Jesus tells is not about hospitality. It's not about bread, even though it does have aspects of bread and hospitality. It is about prayer. And this is the way I think God sometimes works. Just when we think we have everything all put together, everyone tucked nicely into bed, all of our problems dealt with, all of the issues around us kind of sorted out. Something unexpected happens. Have you ever had that happen in your life? Like you're just like, all good, right? And then all of a sudden, the unexpected happens. And I think sometimes God allows, I don't really like that this happens, but I think sometimes God allows for that stuff to happen. The unexpected things to say how, so that he can acknowledge and so that we can think through, how am I going to respond to that which is unexpected? So let's think about our story. A friend shows up. The host has nothing in the cupboards to offer him. And he goes to another friend and says, I need your help. but I want you to notice the approach of the friend who approaches the other friend who has to be awakened now because food is needed. That person leaving their house and going to another house brings nothing with them. They approach their friend hoping their friend will help out. You know that hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, right? Well, if you don't know it, we're gonna sing it at the end of my sermon today, so just in a way, I just wanna let you know that. But, but, but one of the images that Jesus uses is, is to get us to think about prayer is the idea of friend. But what I want us to consider is the approach the man takes as he leaves his house and goes to the house of the other friend to wake him up. He literally has nothing in his hands. He has nothing in the cupboard. He has to acknowledge that he brings nothing to the table. That he cannot outsmart it, he cannot outthink the situation, he cannot sort out the situation unless if he goes to his friend. And when I think about our prayer lives, and I think about my prayer life, I wonder how many times I approach God empty-handed, saying, I really don't know how to deal with this. I don't have the answer. Because sometimes in my prayer life, and your prayer life may be a little different than my prayer life, I like to go to God with these sorts of prayers. God, I've got a great idea. I know exactly how it's going to work out, and I just need you to bless it. I'm sure none of you have ever prayed anything like that. But oftentimes, that tends to be our approach in prayer. 
But I think a part of what this parable is teaching us that Jesus tells is saying, do you approach God empty-handed? Simply saying, Lord, I need your help. I need daily bread, because remember that's what Jesus talked about last Sunday in the text that we looked at. Lord, give us bread for the day, manna for the day. So as we approach our Lord, do we do, and I, and I think about the posture of that, because that means we're approaching God with this great sense of humility. I'm saying, Lord, I'm trusting you with this situation I find myself in. So there's an interesting progression that happens in the life of the Apostle Paul that we see in his writing, which which I kind which I find um, which I find fascinating because sometimes people have an issue with the Apostle Paul and they said, "Oh, he's an egoist. He's this. He's that. He's always you know talking about himself." And 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 I'm kind of like you know, I think people who do what the Apostle Paul did, they probably had a healthy sense of ego because I don't think you could do what he did and not have a healthy sense of ego. But what I find fascinating in the Apostle Paul is as he writes letters to the churches, his understanding of God, what what happens with the Apostle Paul is as he gets closer and closer to God, he realizes he's actually further and further from God. As he understands more and more of who God is, he recognizes the holiness and the wonder and the amazement of the living God. And the Apostle Paul, who had had that amazing encounter with Jesus on on the road to Damascus, all of a sudden starts writing and saying, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about, Paul. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you on the screen, okay? Because so, I know we're all visual learners and we're not all gonna be flipping through our Bibles because I'm gonna hit three verses really fast here. 1 Corinthians 15, verse nine. Paul writes this around 56 AD, okay? So the, and the dates are important in this. Paul says, I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul says, okay, of the, of the 12 apostles, I'm the least of them. So he's like, okay, I'm number 13 or 14, okay? And you, you know, if you're, if you're doing the math on all of that. Okay, five years later, four or five years later, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. This is Ephesians chapter three, verse eight. Now he says, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, Okay, so now he's saying, of all the believers, not just the disciples or the apostles, but of all the believers, I am the least of them. This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Okay, so that's AD 60, AD 61. A couple of years later, as Paul writes to Timothy, this is chapter one, verse 15, 1 Timothy. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. The least of apostles, the least of all followers of Jesus, the chief of all sinners. You see, as the apostle Paul got closer and closer to Jesus, his hands got emptier and emptier and emptier all of his knowledge, all of his training, all the Torah school that he had done, all the teaching of the Hebraic law, he would say, it's nothing. And I am the chief of all sinners and I bring nothing to the table except understanding the grace of Jesus. And so I think this parable that Jesus gives us teaches us something great about what our approach to God looks like. And I think there's sometimes that God says, you know, when we approach him empty-handed, God says, finally, finally you're empty-handed. Finally you recognize that you have nothing and the only reason you have anything is because of Jesus. And I wanna say that to you as an encouragement because it's in our brokenness where God does some of his greatest work. So this parable teaches us about our approach to God. Now, there is this line that I love, which I highlighted as we read it. 
where Jesus says these two words, shameless audacity. Because of this man's shameless audacity, I don't know what shameless audacity looks like. I don't know what shameless audacity sounds like. I do want you to notice that in this, because sometimes we think in this parable that the man's like banging on the door of the house. It never says that. He's yelling, okay? Because he's trying to get the guy awake. We don't hear about knocking until we get to the second part of the story that we read. But his shameless audacity. What does it look like? to be shamelessly audacious in our prayers. I want you to think about that. That's a pretty bold statement. And that's a statement that, by the way, Jesus is making, not Pastor Paul, okay? Jesus is saying because of his shameless audacity will not his friend get up. What does it look like to approach God with shamelessly audacious prayers. I mean, I think this opens up the field to a lot of things and a lot of boldness. But there is this paradox, right? Because we want to be able to pray shamelessly, shamelessly, audaciously. It gets very confusing because I've gone over this in my head numerous times. I'm like, how do I keep... I actually was trying to explain it to Morgan and Shannon last night. It's like, I couldn't say shamelessly audacious. I just like, there's just, there's just like, there's such big long words, right? So, but what is it, what does it mean to approach God in such a way? Because we live in this, this it's like this tension because we say, at least as reform, good reformed Presbyterians, we are going to say God is completely sovereign. God works his plan for good. God sets the world in motion. God is completely in charge. And then the the downside of that is then we're like, well, what the heck do we need to do? Right? Y'all have never thought about that before? I'm assuming you've thought about this before. It is kind of problematic. But then Jesus says, you need to pray with shameless audacity. Because who knows? God might just hear you and God might just do something. Well, now I'm confused. Is it either or? No, it's both and. Because God is God and God can do that kind of stuff. God knows what we need, whether we know it or not. Scott alluded to this, if you're listening carefully to his prayer this morning, he alluded to this. God gives us what we need, whether we pray for it or not, because God knows how our prayers need to be answered, whether we think he's answering them correctly or not. But it is this tension of being shamelessly audacious in our prayer lives, yet trusting God. So Tim Keller puts it like this in his book on prayer, wonderful quote. He says, and this is the tension that we have to hold everything in, we must pray not only with shameless assertiveness, but at the same time with a restful restful submissiveness a confidence that God is wiser than we are and wants the best for us. Shameless assertiveness, yet resting submissiveness. And when I think about prayer, I I like that because it's saying, I'm gonna be as shamelessly audacious as I can in my prayer life. But I'm gonna rest in God's goodness and be submissive to whatever it is that God has planned. But Jesus isn't done because then he says, okay, you need to be persistent. You need to keep asking, you need to keep seeking, you need to keep knocking. Now we're gonna spend some more time next week on talking about persistence in prayer when we look at the widow and the judge. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that this morning other than to say that there is an expectation that we don't give up in prayer. So I've been praying about an issue uh, for the last four or five weeks. And, and as, as, I, as I approached God about this issue, I was saying to God, I think if you were to work this sort of miracle that needs to be worked, God, you would look really good. <laughs> 
This is not a personal issue, by the way. Okay, so this is not about my own personal life. It's another issue that, that I'm, I'm involved in. And I was like, because it would have to be almost miraculous for what needs to happen to happen. But God, seriously, you would get all the glory in this. There would be so many people giving you all the glory in this. And so God, if you would just work this out, it would be awesome. Well, the good Lord has not worked it out yet. But I'm not done because I am going to continue to pray because I do believe in my heart of hearts it would be for God's glory and it would be a good thing and it would be a good thing for a lot of people. So I'm gonna continue to pray. Like we said last week, and I've alluded to many times, Martin Luther, the great early church theologian who started the whole Reformation, said our prayers should be brief, right? What was the second thing? Frequent. Third thing, intense. Brief, frequent, intense. Persisting in prayer. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. God hears us. The final image that we have in our story today is the image of the Father who gives good gifts. Now, we, we alluded to this last week, and I, I just want to bring it back again. We recognize that God is more than just an earthly father. The Gospel of John speaks of God as spirit. The, the Old Testament has images of God as, a, as in feminine images. But Jesus says, I, it, you need to understand that when you pray, it is personal. And so he says you pray Father, but not the earthly father that we think of, but the heavenly father who longs to be in relationship with us. And so Jesus then says, okay, let me tell you about a story about fathers and earthly fathers who are not great. Jesus actually says evil. I mean, that's, that's, you wonder why Jesus lost people sometimes, right? It's like, hey, all of you are evil. I mean, that's a great way to start a sermon, right? Like, but that's what Jesus did. That's why people fell away. But he said, look, even earthly fathers want to give good gifts. And so how much more are your heavenly father? But notice something important now in that story that Jesus tells, because we have moved from outside the house to inside the house. No more knocking, no more seeking, no more yelling. And now you're in the house of the Father. The Father who delights to give good gifts. Now, no one wants a scorpion, right? Because remember, that's what happens. Jesus said, who's gonna give a, give a kid a scorpion? And no one wants a snake. Those are terrible gifts. But guess who got the scorpion and guess who got the snake? Jesus. Jesus bore the weight of our sins. He took the curse upon himself so that we might have life everlasting and life abundant. We don't get the scorpion, we don't get the snake because Jesus got it, and that changes everything. So much so that we went originally asking for bread. And what does Jesus say the Father's going to give us? The Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but weighing out bread and spirit, I'll take the Holy Spirit personally but this is what God does for us. And, and in our prayers, God gives us the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter eight, verses 26 and 27. I, I, I wanna read this verse and just let you know um, that the Sunday before Pentecost, which is May, uh, I don't know, somewhere, the last Sunday of May, whatever that is, and the first Sunday of June, which is Pentecost Sunday, we're gonna spend two weeks talking about the Holy Spirit. But I just wanna give you a little taste of that because this is so good about what the role of the Spirit is in our lives. Romans chapter eight, verses 26, 27. 
in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Okay, right? We come to God empty-handed. We come to God with nothing. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. When we don't know what to say, the power of the Spirit is at work in our lives, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. We ask for bread. We come asking for the the smallest of things. And God says, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. I'm sure those disciples, when Jesus said that they were going to get the gift of the Holy Spirit, they were like, what is he talking about? But as soon as Pentecost happened, they understood because they received the gift of God's Holy Spirit. Prayer is essential for our lives because without it, we don't really get to engage with God. We don't get to fully understand God. And we pray to a God who loves us. We pray to a God who forgives us. We pray to a God who is constantly seeking to instill more and more and more of his Holy Spirit into our lives. So I love to read um, Anne Lamott. Um, not everyone is a big fan of Anne Lamott. I recognize that. Um, but she's hilarious. I don't know if you've ever seen Anne Lamott. I mean, she's just crazy good. And um, I've read just a number of her books. And in one of her books, um, I think it's almost everything, she tells this story of her spiritual mentor for 30 years. And the woman's name is Bonnie. And she says, Bonnie, for 30 years, has been my spiritual mentor, and she makes me so angry sometimes because she refuses to judge me, and she always speaks hope into my life. And then she goes on to say, I sometimes think horrible Bonnie is just like the God I pray to on a regular basis. Because she says, every time I call Bonnie, the first thing she says is, hello, dearest. I'm so glad you called. And Anne Lamott says, isn't this the God we pray to? The one who says to us, hello, dearest. I'm so glad you reached out that even in our worst days, when we cry out to the living God, even when we are completely down, completely lost, feeling completely forsaken, we reach out and God says, hello, dear. Hello, dear one. I'm so glad you called. And I don't want you to forget that because this is the God we pray to, the God who loves you more than you could ever possibly imagine, the God who forgives you deeper than you could ever possibly fathom, is the God who says, I wanna be your friend, and I wanna love you in a way that you have never been loved. Pray with me, please. God, thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you, God, that you want to be not only in relationship with us, but Lord, you want to converse with us. You want to bless us. And even in the midst of what we feel like are cursings and in the midst of what we feel like is sorrow and uncertainty and brokenness, God, that promise is that you will not abandon us or forsake us. So let us cling to your goodness and to your grace. Let us know that you are a God who loves us deeply. Let us know that we are, we are a people that when we pray to you, you say to us, I'm so glad it's you. I'm so glad it's you, dear one. God, thank you for your friendship. 
Thank you for your love and your grace. And we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.